these East End families. He wasn't the failure he expected to be, and during the fortnight felt strangely drawn, as he put it, to these people who had never heard such preaching before. Here is a sphere, was being whispered continually in my inward ear by an inward voice. Why go farther afield for audiences? William knew then that this was where God wanted him to be. It was obvious from, from the start that this man had a special aura. There, there was just something about him. He spoke the language of the people. He spoke the things of God in terms that the people could understand and relate to. Of course, his background and the poverty he had seen in Nottingham and the poverty stricken people that he had often served in the pawn shop, all that really added up to make him the kind of man that he was, the man, a man for the people. The work was hard and demanded creative responses to difficult situations. The old tent blew down irretrievably one night and William and his fellow Christian missioners searched for a venue that East End people would feel at home in. They found a dance hall for the Sunday meetings, while on weeknights they met in an old wool warehouse in Bethnal Green. More and more meeting places were needed for the growing numbers. In Poplar, they met in a smelly shed between a stable and a pigsty. In Old Ford, they met in a carpenter's shop. In Whitechapel, they met in a skittle alley. And in Shoreditch, they met in a stuffy room behind a pigeon shop. Money raised by Catherine's upper-class contacts meant that William was later able to rent the old Effingham Theatre. There regularly mounted 40, 50 and 60 sinners onto the stage on a Sunday night seeking mercy. In this dirty theatre, at the time perhaps one of the lowest in London, we were fairly introduced to the public. And from that day, the work went forward with increased rapidity. William and Catherine, by now the leaders of the newly named Christian Mission, encouraged these early converts to go to churches and chapels to learn more about their new faith. Many of these churches were not happy with their pews being occupied by dirty, ragged, literate, smelly individuals. And it was those kind, kinds of people that were responding to Booth's message. And so he, he discovered he had a problem in his hands. What will he do with these people? They were coming back to him and they, they, they were saying that there's really no welcome for us there. Well, of course, they had to begin training them. And because William Booth was a pragmatist, he realized very early on that like attracts like. And if you've got a converted boxer or a converted boozer or a converted thief, their mates would come and listen to them. They knew what they were like before they were converted, and they were impressed by the change they'd seen in those lives. True to form, William and Catherine couldn't ignore the physical needs of the people they encountered each day. And the Christian Mission's first report in 1867 shows just how much they responded. It lists evening classes, ragged schools, reading rooms, penny banks, soup kitchens, and relief for the poor by distribution of bread, meat, and small sums of money. The People's Market in Whitechapel became the mission headquarters for organizing all this activity, with Catherine's expert advice. 16-year-old Bramwell Booth ran a small chain of food for the million shops, which provided the poor with hot soup at all hours and three-course dinners for sixpence. These were revolutionary activities in their time, and came simply out of a compassionate and immediate response to people in need. Poor people feel the cold quite as much, if not more, than do the rich people. No one gets a blessing if they have cold feet, and nobody ever got saved while they had the toothache. Booth took the view, which is now, I guess, regarded uh, as um, over-modern in some quarters, that poverty and sin went together. I mean, there's letters and speeches time after time that the man who is poor is more likely to steal. The man who is poor is more likely to take refuge in drink. The woman who is destitute is more likely to go out onto the streets. It seemed to me to be self-evident. But a lot of people didn't believe it then, and some people don't believe it now. But William Booth said, if we're going to attack the devil, 